My basic thesis is that crypto is generative technology that literally creates new users, new marketplaces, new things, meeting participatory capital formation. And by capital formation, I mean, how do you pool money together to build a business that wouldn't otherwise be possible? Solana is saying not only possible on Solana, from a technical sense, yes, but we're starting to figure out, oh, that's from a business sense too, right? That capital formation and business model is absolutely crazy. So generative tech, like by definition, creates abundance. Generative tech always cannibalizes the market for scarcity. This episode is brought to you by Access Protocol. Access Protocol is the best way to get access to premium crypto content without the ads, without the annoying subscriptions that are impossible to cancel. It's crypto native, it's here today. Go check them out. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we're joined by Josh Rosenthal, who's an investor, an entrepreneur, a master historian, and Josh, I'm just going to say it, an artist. Um, you have an unbelievable background. You're one of the best speakers I've ever listened to. And yeah, I don't think I didn't introduce you any better than that. But I want you to introduce yourself to the audience because your credentials are insane and very different from the normal person we have on this podcast. Oh, dear. All right. This is going to be a tough one to live up to. Um, like In a nutshell, you know, I have a background. Um, as a French Renaissance medieval historian, so I have a PhD earned in that field, and then did a Fulbright to the Sorbonne's interdisciplinary think tank, uh, working on complex systems. And I've lectured at Ivy League universities on innovation and resistance, but more importantly, I'm actually a founder. So we founded a couple of companies, one in AI, uh, which we sold to an MIT spin out a long time ago in natural language processing. And then another one, which was data visibility, it was, you know, B2B SaaS, we sold to a publicly traded company, helped take them back private. And for that work, you know, it was named Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year and vested out in 17 and then got all into crypto, uh, you know, all in. And so I'm an investor, we're fund to fund, so we're kind of first money in multi-coin, uh, you know, a number of other folks you might know, Parify, Coin Fund, uh, Standard, folks like that, and then do direct things and most importantly, operate the stuff ourselves. Um, so. That's it in a nutshell. Easy peasy. The only reason I mentioned that is I'm going to be saying a lot of stuff. And like, if I'm listening, I'm like, why should I listen to this guy? What does he know about, you know, he's going to be talking about a bunch of crazy stuff. I'm going to be speaking as a historian, also speaking as a founder who's done it a couple of times, and now speaking as an investor, like someone who pivoted from AI into crypto specifically. Okay. Oh boy. Uh, not sure where to start. So, okay. We, we got history. We got first money to multi-coin. We got two-time founder, AI, um, can, okay, so I'm actually, uh, believe it or not, I'm an extremely, uh, I want to be a history professor uh, when, when I was, uh, when I was You're killing school. me. We can't start this way. You're killing me right out of the gate. Oh, dear. <laughs> you made the right is, decision not doing it. <laughs> what, uh, can we just maybe get some um, commentary on why you picked, like what ex happened at each step to kind of push you onto these new paths. Like you start from history, you did entrepreneurship, you got to crypto. Like why did all these things happen? Just some, just some comments. Yeah, I, I really, I've never been good at holding down a job is like the honest answer. I just can't do anything, you know, any single thing for too long. I'm just like a rat after like a cocaine drip looking for the most interesting thing going on. And so academics, I was doing a PhD with uh, this icon in the field who's really well known. And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't turn that down. It was super interesting. I was looking specifically around like social history of ideas and so around the transition from institutional atrophy in the Middle Ages to the recreation of society, what we call a renaissance. And so that was archival manuscript work. So you're in these like esoteric archives in you know France where you literally need a letter from the head of state to get in there and you're, you're reading manuscripts in these hands, super privileged, no one has access to it. And I started working through that economic and social networks and trying to figure out why did things change when like the world is atrophied and technology is bypassed institutions? How do you dig yourself out of the hole? What happens? And so, you know, finished that degree, did the Fulbright over at the Sorbonne Institute for Advanced Study, their Colpractic Dis Institute. It's like a AIS, what they have at Princeton. So you're talking to certain scientists and I'm a humanities guy and I built some modeling stuff to kind of model out these networks. And you're looking at these economic roles. And as I'm looking through these documents, like it becomes super apparent, things start to change. All of a sudden, I'm looking at like wealth and power being concentrated and then all of a sudden it being participatory and like this new thing exploding all over Europe and then the world, like the birth of the middle class. And like I was trying to figure out how did this happen? 
And as you look through the documents, you literally start to see in the manuscripts the advent of like two specific decentralized technologies. The first was this what we call double entry bookkeeping, which was ledger based accounting. Sounds stupid, basic, like debit and credit, but it was the birth of capitalism and the middle class and transformed the world in a variety of ways. And the second was a permissionless, you know, print protocol, which was the creation of information without authority and the distribution of information along with ownership without authority that just took the world by storm. And those two things like led to a radical transformation of identity and blah, 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 blah. So I finished the degree. The university stuff was interesting. I had a couple tenure track offers, but like did not pursue them partially because like when I started, I'm so old, I started in the university when there's barely the internet, right? So you had to go to university because that's where all the information was. Like as I went through the years and what have you, the information, the locus of information was outside the university. The university was like the dumbest place you could possibly be. And so like that seemed like not a good future path to, to take. So I finished the degree and then my wife and partner and our Turkish co-founder, you always have to have a Turkish co-founder when you're doing a startup. Like they basically were, you know, had done a startup and exited and they wanted to do another startup. And they were looking at like social, you know, similarity indexing. They were looking at like, the relationship between quantitative and qualitative interfaces through some natural language processing stuff. And I said, hey, I have I can see how this could work based on some of the stuff I did. So we did a startup. We sold it within a couple of years to an MIC spin out. We took that acquisition back to private equity. And then I got a taste for it. It was really fun being in the marketplace and saying, hey, it's not my idea. It's not what I think. It's not what like my peers think. Like The marketplace is the great ring, right? It determines what's right and what's wrong, like what the market wants. And that was super interesting. So we did another startup. You know, all of this was angel bootstrap, no VC. Um, and this one, we grew for a number of years and uh, sold it to a publicly traded company. And it was around B2B SaaS type stuff. And then won a number of awards for that and then helped take them back private. And so that was super interesting. And then we essentially said, hey, we really like this founding thing. We want to help other founders. We're based here in Louisville, Kentucky, like off the beaten path, right? How can we help people outside power hubs who want to be entrepreneurs? And like the problem with the Web2 VC model is that it really aggregates power and control to the power hubs, right? Like, even if you're running a small fund, like 100 million, you have to have a billion dollar exit. You know, you make 10 investments, you have the rounds, you basically have to have that. And it just, the math doesn't work out unless you're looking for like superhuman outcomes. And if you're a founder, you might not need a billion dollar outcome. You might be happy with 100 million or 10 million. And so there are these conflicting expectations in that model. And we just weren't happy with that. So that's when we got into crypto. And like getting into crypto was kind of an esoteric experiment. You know, when we started looking at it, it, what really struck me was I was looking at the same type of ledger activity. I was like, holy frick, this is literally what unlocked like the recreation of the civilization last time. And the same thing with print. And a lot of people compare print to the internet. I, I disagree with that. I don't think that's right at all because like there's ownership associated with print. And so the idea of like creating like per information permissionlessly without having to go to university, without having somebody have to put a seal of authority on it and doing it through hardware that took on a life of its own, that was generative technology that actually created something de novo bigger than the previous market. Like print actually created literacy, print created the marketplace. It's the exact opposite of what you get taught in school. And so when I was looking at crypto, I was like, okay, store value I get, that makes sense, fine. The idea of like generative technology, I can see that. That's like really interesting, abundance versus scarcity we can get into. But then the idea of like this ledger-based stuff, not just being fintech, but being like new capital formation, that's like totally transformative. There are like dozens of renaissances before the one we talk about. And like that last one succeeded because it had new capital formation. It was the birth of capitalism. It was participation. You were no longer like locked on a medieval manor. You could actually like hang up a shingle you could get a loan, you could make something, you could sell it, you didn't need permission, more participation, like through capital formation, took down like oligarchy, capitalism took down monarchy. And so I was like, frick, like, what if crypto isn't just better, faster, cheaper tech? What if it's new ways to build businesses, like solve cold start problems, jump modes, all that sort of stuff. And then we're just all in basically. And so we're all in on the institutional side, liquid and venture with a bunch of the folks that are fairly well known. And then we do direct stuff ourselves. And then fundamentally, we were like technicians, technological folks. And so we we operated stuff like in the early days. And then primarily, like we're out in Louisville, Kentucky, in the middle of nowhere. And so we wanted to say, does this have real world impact? Like, can you actually do something meaningful, like outside of buying a Lambo? And so the building I'm in is an old bourbon bar from literally, you know, 160 years old through prohibition, survived fires. It's slated for demolition. They're going to turn it into mini storage. We're down the street from Churchill Downs. 
And so we ran a little Helium IoT node back in 17 and for 500 bucks, no coding on an app, use the proceeds to do a full historical renovation, stop the crime, stop the heroin fires and now turn into a community center. And we're like, okay, so there's actually a bridge NFTs from IRL to synthetic that can have community impact that can solve problems that governments can't solve and do it through a marketplace. And we're like, frick, that's what we want to do. So it's a long answer, but it was a big question. Well said. So I am curious on one specific. Oh man, on, where are you killing me? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very selfish. Um, no, but, it's all right. I, I told I'm you, curious. Josh, I was like, Mart's going to come for you. I know Garrett, like <laughs> Garrett and I plan out this beautiful thing. We're going back and forth. Like, I really appreciate these conversations because they force me to like think through more clearly. Like I can't, I can't write. I'm not even literate anymore. And so the idea of just like having to like craft a conversation previously, I've done this Renaissance stuff where I'm like, Hey, they recreated their world through decentralized communicate, you know, communication and finance and re- changed identity. And that was nice. I've done that for permissionless at their keynote and the bankless stuff. And then Garrett was like, hey, how did they do that? How did they actually work on Twitter? And I was like, oh, frick, that's a really good question. And that like forced me to say, oh, they did it because the technology was generative, net new, not just bigger slice of a pie, not just bigger pie, but net new pies stacked. And they did it through capitalism as new capital formation. And so like, that's the unlock. So that was like, that was super helpful. So we craft this whole thing, but uh, go ahead, Mert. I'm super eager to hear. <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, I mean, obviously you're a, you're a different thinker uh, and, and two other different thinkers that we've had in the show before have been Kyle and Tushar and your first money into them. So I'm, I'm curious on that story. How did you meet them? What did you think? What was the first impression? All the good stuff. Oh man, Kyle and Tushar, are like they're two of our favorite people just absolutely like out of the gate um just for a whole variety of reasons and uh it kind of depends what you want to do allocating do you want to be liquid do you want to go venture do you want to do infrastructure like there's chain the things that i love about kyle and tashar just like first principle thinking and just not give like making a bet unapologetically and not giving a damn it's just absolutely beautiful like i'd almost rather listen to them like blather on inanity than anybody else like try to do something scripted how like full disclosure my wife, she's always our CEO. She's the brains and gravitas. I'm just like the talking monkey out front. And so she found them when they're raising, like, very, when no, yeah, like first in. And I, how did she even find them? I don't know. She kind of roots around and she's like, hey, this is batshit crazy. But like, these guys are like the most counterintuitive, like, ace, like asymmetric bet you can possibly make. And back then it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to allocate at scale, right? Like, people were just spinning things up. And so, like not to get too far into the details. And like what we loved about them is they just published everything online. She's like, read these white papers. And I was like, holy frick, this is like, 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 and she was previous VC in a, in a different life. And so like the stuff that they kept on binders hidden behind is alpha. These multi-coin guys are publishing for the world to read and they're not afraid to be wrong and they persist it. It's just like, it's absolute madness. Like, and we'll kind of get into that in the whole crypto thing. Like, One of my theses is that like everybody's a VC. This idea between VC and retail is like a false dichotomy, like for a variety of reasons. Like anyone has access to what these guys and others are publishing. That's madness 10, 20 years ago. Um, So yeah, I mean, they were, they were lights out. They gave us the bug for sure. Well, that was the cathedral versus the bazaar. We tried to plan <laughs> everything, but Mert came in out of nowhere and made it the bazaar. Yeah, um, Mert, it, Mert's bazaar. That's but sure. if, if the audience, obviously you've listened to Josh now for the last 10 minutes and you can tell he's a very impressive person um, and why we were having him on the podcast. You may have also heard him do some podcasts for the last two years that centered around the crypto uh, renaissance, the crypto revolution, which are all historical contexts and how they have analogies and parallels to today. But Josh, what jumps out at me in all of your past talks is this concept of scarcity versus abundance and how that played out in the past, but really how that's actually playing out today in crypto. I would really just like you to dive into that concept of scarcity versus abundance and how we're seeing that evolution play out in crypto right now. No, that's great. Thanks for queuing that up. That's a, like previously I've gone on and on about, and if you want the details and the historical analogies, you can listen to the empire stuff or the bankless stuff or the the very first permissionless keynote had like pictures and you can look at that sort of stuff. And there's really good historical reasons to think that crypto is a renaissance. Like if you look at changes, 
you know, communities recreate their world when they use decentralized technology. And like I talked about communication and value and identity and communication through permissionless, you know, print protocols, value through double entry bookkeeping as ledgers. And identity is the ability to do something else besides be stuck on the farm. And so that stuff is out there. You can go into the details. Like that's kind of the first, that's the thing you have to have in your head to even like kind of understand the rest of it. But what really drives the how they actually did that, you know, there are dozens of renaissances before. Why did that one succeed? Why, if I'm talking about, you know, 20 other ones you haven't heard of, why do you know about the last one? And the answer is because like they used very specific technology, which was generative and like that'll take us into abundance versus scarcity. And then that generative technology, they captured the value through a new capital formation, which was participatory. And that was the, the mega unlock. So that idea of like scarcity versus abundance is like, a really important thread to think through. Like my basic thesis is that crypto is generative tech, which sounds basic. It means like technology that literally creates new users, new in the marketplaces, new things, meeting participatory capital formation. And by capital formation, I mean, how do you pool money together to build a business that wouldn't otherwise be possible? You know, and Solana is saying not only possible on Solana, from a technical sense, yes, but we're starting to figure out, oh, that's from a business sense too, right? I can do things with business models, drip or whatever that I wouldn't be able to do on another tech stack for a variety of reasons. But like that capital formation and business model is absolutely crazy. So generative tech, like by definition, creates abundance. And the key like idea here the academics will talk about is it's value through utility. Like a rock under my bed isn't very useful if it's gold or not. Fiat is a little le- more useful like credit and debit more useful, derivatives more useful. Now I can have a mortgage, now I can get collateral, now I can do this stuff. Like utility and people using stuff actually makes it more the most useful. And like, it's a very basic example, but like the printing press is like a really good place to double click on right now. Like print was a permissionless protocol to create, distribute, and own information. All of these things were unimaginable in the medieval world. You couldn't create, you weren't literate, you didn't know how to read or write. It was incredibly expensive to create something. A few guys did it by hand as on manuscripts. I used to read them. They're often gilded in gold. How would you distribute it? There's not enough of them out there to be able to share information at scale. And you couldn't own it. You couldn't own it. Like, you know, a book costs a year's salary or 10 years salary or like uh, beyond what you could ever amass in a lifetime. And so this idea of having like print actually being a technology that generated an abundance, like distributing, creating and owning information was madness. Like print actually created the market. Print created literacy. It's the opposite of what they teach you in business school. If Gutenberg and it was, you know, a startup founder, he'd go down Sand Hill Road and he'd get laughed out of every VC's office. They'd say, hey, Gutenberg, didn't you learn at HBS? You can't bring out like a, you know, a product where there is no market, where only 5% of the population can read. That doesn't make sense. The technology itself was generative. It actually created value and markets. It unlocked something that was not otherwise possible. It sounds so simple, but it's like magic. You really have to wrap your head around that. And there was more value from something that was abundant with utility. Manuscripts were controlled. You didn't have access to them. There's more utility with print that was everywhere and you could get for the price of a dinner. And what was contr- why was it valuable? Because the nature of what was conveyed through the technology itself was valuable. It was information, it was skill, it was entertainment. It was the ability to know how to create something itself. How do I use a ledger? How do I do double entry bookkeeping? Oh, I can see it. I can read it. I can't really read. My friend in the community can kind of show it. They'll do public readings at taverns and they'll walk you through it. How do I actually become a tanner or a smith? I can go through a medieval guild and waste a lifetime, or I can actually learn it from a book. The ability to abstract information and do it at scale was crazy. And what happened was it cannibalized the current market. That's like a really important thing. Generative tech always cannibalizes the market for scarcity. And so if you think about like a manuscript that's written on a skin or parchment, it's a couple of monks in a monastery taking years to write something and gilding it beautifully. <clears throat> and that market went to zero. Like it actually, it went to zero as like the print took over basically. And so like it cannibalized the current market by creating a new market. It didn't grow the manuscript market, created a new market. And then once that's unlocked, the real magic and the you know techno social theorists will talk about first order and second order unfolds. Like that print was like the first order unfold. It was better, faster, cheaper, generated a market like magic or alchemy. 
And then the second order unfold was what was otherwise not imaginable, the digitization of print, our internet, as we call it. And so the internet is the tech of abundance, like without participatory ownership is the thing to think about. And so printing press, generative tech, it actually created a market, it created the ability to use it out of nothing, de novo, which was like magic. But the basic idea is that generative tech, a lot of people say, oh, you know, it's not increasing the size of the pie, we're making the pie bigger. That's like not correct from like, like the idea of generative tech is makes new pies that stack up. And that's like, that's absolutely amazing. So hopefully that gives you a, a sense of generative technology creating the marketplace instead of serving a marketplace that exists. You can use modern examples, buggy whips and horses, cars cannibalizing that, even if you have a good horse carriage with a great buggy whip, like the next generative technology cannibalizes the first wave and then it unlocks next order magnitude business models. Uber, Airbnb, through collateral and mortgages, blah, 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 blah. Like, that's the basic idea. I think that's the hardest thing to grasp when you're in crypto is how can value be created almost out of nowhere? It's like for the first time in some ways, one plus one <laughs> doesn't equal two, it's three. And sometimes that's a complete farce. It does not. Like one plus one always equals two. But like you said, there are these certain areas and these opportunities where you actually do have this generative opportunity. One thing I'm curious about, when you had, at the time, everything was scarce, like you said, you didn't have the printing press. Uh, maybe you had one copy of a book in your town. And then all of a sudden, you had the printing press. And also, for jumping ahead to the internet, like the main thing you have is this abundance of new information and stories and narratives everywhere. How did people in the past handle that? Because like even today in crypto, you're seeing you had Bitcoin and Ethereum, but then you had all these Ethereum forks. Now you have all these L2s, and then you have all these NFT projects. Like, How do people get a grasp? Like, Can we really handle that sort of abundance? Is that where like discovery and curation somehow come into this. Now that absolutely forces a choice. I mean, that's like, like make no mistake, like the medieval world is like safe, it's secure, it's coddled. You don't have to leave the farm. It's unpleasant. You're working dawn to dusk. Like not having choice is like a lot of people elect to choose that option. Like during the Renaissance, like with a lot of people chose to ignore it. Like they had the optionality to like hang up a shingle, become an entrepreneur, become a merchant, like start a business like become middle class and they chose not to do that. And like historians, like moderns, like we look back and say, oh, that's so silly. But like the idea of having to like find your own way and choose things like that was always the criticism of decentralization, generative tech, that like you're going to explode the marketplace. You're going to explode information. You're not only exploding the number of manuscripts, you're exploding the number of things, right? Like, and then you have veracity issues and perspectivity issues, like what's true, what's not true, what's better, like the idea behind like decentralization from a historical perspective is that like it opens up the opportunity for the other, basically. Like it's not replacing one thing, one king, one pope with like one chain, one protocol, one new community. It's opening up like a pole on a spectrum that has design space all along. And like, yeah, now you have design space all along. Now you have to like make decisions and decide what's best. What do you want to do? Like, and that's definitely scary. The flip side of that is, and we'll get into this when we get into like the, the birth of capitalism, is that like it opens up like opportunity for you for what you do want to do. Like what is vocation? Like what are you interested in doing? Like what's your calling? Like what you like to do and what you're good at, you can now make a living doing, which was like absolutely radical. And so like with the internet, basically it was the same thing. It's explosion of information. Like now it's easier. Read, write without own, fine. Like, but like how are you going to sift through that basically? And so... That's where you'll get into like AI as generative technology and like the idea of like surfacing and exposing and curating. Like if you look like big picture, this ticking and talking back and forth, like between aggregation, decentralization is that like the explosion of information is like it's it's a feature. It's not a bug. We we humans in history at a certain point in time, we're always scared of the next unlock. What happens when there's print? What happens when there's an internet? What happens when people can create stuff? When I was like starting out in academics, my professor said, don't ever look at the internet. It's not peer reviewed. It's like, well, like that, like think about an encyclopedia like set, right? Like how often do I use an encyclopedia it has very little utility, right? And the margins on those went down and down and down. Now I can search for anything. I can likewise search without a book. I can figure out how to write code, how to do a business. Now there's GitHub, Replit, all sorts of other stuff. I don't even have to know how to do it. I can abstract that out. Like as we go further up in the progression, like it actually unlocks markets, but they're right. Like you can't peer review it. The flip side of that is the, the left, you know, right curve thinkers will tell you none of the stuff is ever really peer reviewed anyway. That was all like just a facade of kayfabe and opacity. So like it's scary, but it does free you up to say, hey, 
what do I really want to be doing? So rather than working a shitty desk job where you're filing like TPS reports, you can say, hey, I'm really into booze. I'm really into music. I'm really into ISP. I can actually like build a business to support myself with economic substrate more than a hobby trying to monetize it as a creator. That was the <clears throat> that was the massive unlock. Generative tech, the, the renaissance was generative tech, like just like the internet is generative tech. But the renaissance was also new capital formation, new ways to build businesses to solve cold starts. And like the internet was generative tech without new capital formation. And so that's why like if we pull on this other thread of like, why did that last renaissance succeed? Like it wasn't just new generative tech. It was generative tech creating new marketplaces, the marketplace for media, the marketplace for learning how to build a business, like tied to new capital formation. And that was like crazy. And that's something that's like often, often unlike, like we gloss over it so easily, like bigger slice, bigger pie, da, 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 da. It's like, that's crazy. If you think of crypto as a store of value, fine. There's other podcasts for that. Got it. Generative tech, very interesting. New internet, that's interesting. New capital formation, that's like madness. Like, are you telling me there's new ways to build businesses? Like in the Web2 world, like where we did our startups and like did earlier investing, there's only so many business models. They'll tell you, you know, any of your combinators, like, hey, only so many business models, but make an execution play. Like crypto actually says, no, no, there are new business models. There's new way to create utility from a network, from nothing, de novo. Just like you said, Garrett, like, oh, we're like, oh, crypto can't, you can't create anything from nothing. That's what happened at the Renaissance. That is literally print. We created literacy and markets for media from nothing. That's what happened with the Renaissance with capitalism. We created the middle class from nothing through the ability to get a loan, to take a loan, to do credit, to, to be able to build something, to sell something without permission. The coins were too scarce. There wasn't enough like hard metal currency to go around. That was the restricting agent in that world. The Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian, he's at a wedding basically in Germany and he wants to buy new clothes and the merchant won't sell him new clothes because he doesn't have coin on him. That was their world. And like that was like, that also ties into this idea of like scarcity versus abundance. In that world, like value is land and land was scarce. There's only so much, only 21 million like hectares, right? Something like that. It's a Bitcoin joke. Like there's only so much land, right? And so like every generation that gets whittled and whittled and whittled. So you pass it on to your first son, your other sons, you send them off to the crusades to fight. They come back, they start pillaging and doing stuff. These are like mercenaries and lands connect, like all the, all the stuff the historians talk about. And then basically, what do you do? It's just chaos. Like with like capitalism, like now you're on a farm and you say, hey, you've read something or you've been to like a town reading at your bar, or your tavern. And they say, hey, Mert, you don't have to stay on this farm. You can actually go off and like, you can be a freaking uh, metal smith. Did you know that? Here's a book, like, let's do this together. I'll loan you this based on credit. You pay me back a percentage over time. Like that's, that's madness. You're literally creating that. You're making goods and services. You're selling that. And now you're creating value for your, for your neighbor. These are real people in history. Like that previously, like it's like a, uh, a German mercenary who's like a crusader comes back and says, no, I'm going to be a wool merchant. He takes a ledger, can't really read or write, scratches it out. He buys wool bulk, sends it off in ships from England, sends it to Antwerp. Antwerp, his former enemy is sitting there with a ledger, getting a credit on the balance. They turn the stuff to wool. He takes it back over. He's working with his enemy, like not just like pillaging. He's creating a new marketplace, wool for his people. And then guess what? It's not just restricted to him. All the, all the people on the farms and peasants and indentured servants are participating. I realize I'm oversimplifying, but it's like a massively crazy thing to think about your ability to participate in that, like undoing, like, you know, atrophied, atrophied institutions. So that was like absolutely magic. And the idea was value was scarce in land. Now it's value is created from nothing, not Ponzi value, not like internet pejorative value, like real thing, clothes, food, like uh, businesses, goods, services, products was created through the marketplace. And what happened? There's a birth of the middle class that was like new capital formation benefiting society. That's what drove like the, the recreation of the world. Capitalism creating value from nothing, but it also being participatory. It was absolutely magic. You have an idea of how to, now you know how to print something. The impact was also vocation. You don't like being a farmer, Garrett. Guess what? You're really into woodworking. Great. Now you can go be a smith, not working for a salary for a lord who decides what you're going to make. You creating products like 
maybe selling some on credit, maybe bartering, maybe booking it on a ledger, and you're able to build a business for you and your family and build surplus. It was generative economic models through a new type of creation. It was like absolutely like madness, basically. New ways of pulling money to build businesses from loans to and from others above you socioeconomically, laterally below you. You could go out and hang a shingle. Like that was like, that was absolutely crazy. And of course, the institutions resist. They resisted until they couldn't because value creation itself is a generative asset. Just like tech is generative, that capital formation, the way you build a business, a new business model is generative. It let other people win with you. And like the long arc of history benefited you as well as others. So when we say capitalism, like today it gets a bad rap, like cronyism, but the idea of working for yourself to benefit your neighbor and your friends and your family and your world, like in an objective way that has value, it was a massive unlock. You could do what you like to do and what you were good at. And the result was just like amazing. If you no longer live on a manor as an indentured servant, it's capitalism. If you own a house or a car or took a mortgage and used collateral, that's a result of it. Like you found that you could participate, not in just what you created, like you had systematic access like further out. And that was like massive. The downside of that was like all sorts of bad stuff happens, fine, 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 but it was also limited. Like the way you created that economic model was by ownership. You had to put money in to basically get money out. And so it was more participatory. It was a medieval lord, but it wasn't as participatory as the next unlock, which was like fractional equity and ownership, which it like takes us to the birth of the stock market and the Dow. Like so the Renaissance, generative technology and new capital formation was magic. Then basically we have like new capital formation, another form of it that was more participatory, like with fractional equity and the limited liability company. I'll go into that and then I'll go into the internet and then we can kind of go from there. But let me take a pause. Does that sound okay? Or am I, am I boring you guys to tears? <laughs> keep, keep going. Yeah, Josh, I, I've told you this before the podcast. This, you, <laughs> to make a lame analogy, you're the painter. This podcast is just the canvas for you and Mert's there to keep you in check. <laughs> Also, if you're oh, watching this podcast, one, check it out on YouTube. But uh, one, Josh is smoking out of a pipe. It's a lot of fun. But two, you mentioned how I think the building that you're working in um, is actually burnt down. And if you look, Mark, you can see it now behind Josh. It's actually burnt. You can see where the fire was behind the wall. So kind of a cool Easter egg. Oh, yeah. There's a prohibition fire, like when they're doing that. Yeah, it's a, uh, and that, yeah, that gets us into like, that'll take us into this idea is like, Partici capital formation from participation. Can you turn your cost centers into revenue generation like anywhere? Like that's why the D pin and like IRL stuff and RWA stuff is like super interesting. So yeah, that was, so yeah, long story short, like Renaissance is like generative tech meets capital formation. And like we've had, when you get them both together, that's magic. It's one plus one equals a million, right? We've had different pieces previously. We've had, we've had new capital formation. That happened like with like fractionalized equity in the birth of li limited liability system. That was crazy. The idea, like previously, if you wanted to build a business, it was just like the uh, the same way from the Renaissance all the way up until you know, 18th, 19th century. You had to do it with friends and family. Why? Because you took liability when you did that. And so you didn't trust anybody else. So you only did it with people you really trusted. So if I'm building a business, I'm not going to let Merton because I don't trust him. And like maybe something bad goes, happens, right? So if my business takes off, Mert can't participate in that. He can't get upside on that. So the idea of the LLC that created fractionalized equity was massive. Now, if I build a business and it's the next Google, Merck can buy a share of that. And so now we have further economic unlock from participation. And that was like massive. It was the birth of NASDAQ. It's the birth of the Dow. It's like worth noting that every one of these unlocks has like massive resistance, right? The medieval regimes tried to resist print and they tried to resist like fractional, like uh, the new fintech from ledgers until they couldn't because there's so much utility and there's so much capital formation. It was to their advantage not to no longer to resist it. Same thing with like just this new capital formation with Dow and NASDAQ. Everybody went apeshit when that happened. Like literally, if you read like the, the well-known papers of the time, it says, oh, this is the death of like the world. No one's going to be liable for anything. It's going to be craziness, blah, 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 blah. Instead, what happened? That is like the greatest like modern wealth creation like in history by a magnitude of order compared to anything before that, which was the Renaissance. And like, so there is FUD from everybody. And even today, even like when they can't ban the asset class, they try banding the assets within, right? Like when Apple, when IPO Massachusetts says you can't like get into it because it's too risky. If you bought a share for a thousand bucks, it's worth a million and a half today, right? Like this is just kind of what we do until we don't do that. 
the arch overall is that like utility and participation, capitalism has increased utility for capital formation. Gold isn't as useful as fiat, isn't as useful as credit and debit, isn't as useful as loan and mortgage, isn't as useful as like fractionalized ownership for collateral. This is the greatest wealth creation in history by like tech as abundance captured by more and more like value creation from participation. That didn't happen. So when you get into limited liability, like what drove the stock market for the past 50 years? Well, that's that's the internet. That is literally the internet's promise was for participation. And like that didn't happen. Like Andreessen will talk about the original sin of the internet not being able to persist state. So you have to like outsource a database to use your login credentials, blah, blah. All that's true. But the basic idea is that like you don't get ownership. Ownership still goes to equity holders. So print and media goes digital. And it follows this aggregation curve. Debt is the new oil and it drives FANG to like nation state statuses. The value of the stock market accrues like to these owners from FANG. It's essentially like oligarchy in every like vertical and horizontal, maybe duopoly in some cases, like OS, device, broadcast layer, it doesn't matter. It again is another magnitude of order larger in wealth creation historically, but it's only for the equity holders, only if you bought the stock, right? Like if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you don't buy the stock, you don't get it. And guess what? People who have more disposable income, bigger cash, get bigger yields. And so like that's very different. Like you, you have to wait till IPO. The value is created when Google is two dudes in a garage who are literally ready to sell. True story for a million bucks because they're so demoralized. That's when you want to be able to invest. But you can't do that. You have to like wait until it comes out into IPO and then you have to have surplus cash. So what happens with that surplus cash? It gets funneled into moats. Why? To avoid challengers. And so if you're doing a startup and you're trying to build a network, you have to have massive capital and massive venture to like pour money into thing like budget, like ads to, to get inorganic users, to influence people to do things. And this all becomes supercharged with VC. Like you have to be accredited, your alphas in your Rolodex. You do get access to that early stage Google, like beyond IPO, like et cetera, et cetera. So that's why like counteracting that, that's why crypto is like radically different. The internet was a false fork. Yeah, it didn't preserve ownership. That's true in a technical sense for sure. It was also a false fork because the value, which was extraordinary, went to like capital holders who basically created moats and like supercharged like, you know, barriers. Uh, there was no cold start solving in that. In fact, it was a feature, not a bug to prevent like challengers. And so crypto is new capital formation. When I say it fulfills the internet's promise. I mean, like literally you earn for your participation instead of being the product. And like in your lifetime, dad is the new oil. You, most academics will estimate you earn six, seven figures that go to Fang of your data. You give away for free. You give it away for free just because like you get a freemium subscription. You don't get paid for that. Like now you can choose not to share that or you can choose to get paid for that. Like Helium Mobile with a mapping is a great example. Like, so that idea, you earning from participation, not just from capital, of course you can invest but earning with your time and attention is radical like it benefits the users of the network you're no longer a product so that value accrues to the users yeah equity and ownership but also usage which if you're paycheck to paycheck or don't have the same ratio of disposable income that's radical because you're getting in super early at the same time and it's anti-inflationary in like a very meaningful sense like inflation, like obviously just decimates middle class in a real world, whether it's realized or just QE, having less cash and getting less equity to keep up on the trend, like is, is a bad cycle, deleterious for everyone. If you can earn ownership through use, it's like it's anti-inflationary for middle class. Like that's that's super radical in its own right. The true nature of like a, being a new business model is the ability to solve these cold start problems and bypass those moats. Like as a former Web2 venture capitalist founder, like I'll tell you, like moat is everything. Once you get over 100 million, all they want is like decommoditization and like TAM, right? And so the idea is like, how do you preserve that moat? Bureaucracy is a feature, not a bug in that system. And so the idea of saying, hey, we can overcome a moat. We can do telco with 100 million instead of billions and billions. We can create a network from nothing by incentivizing participation. I know we all know this, but that's freaking magic. That's alchemy. That's like, black magic in the middle ages that's crazy like that idea is like absolute madness and so like helium in full disclosure i own some stuff or like the guys or don't like the guys or have 
conflicted opinions, disclosure, disclosure, but like Helium on that is like a great example. Like you incentivize early participants to create a network instead of spending magnitudes of order to create, to influence people to do it. And the psychology of that is massive. Instead of paying someone to, to do a little thing, whether it's map a thing, they're actually a participant and a co-owner in that. It's absolutely radical. And now you're solving public good problems from earning, which is wild. Like Helium on the mobile side, like where does that money go basically? Or where does it come from? If you put it sitting right next to me, we're broadcasting like huge high power antennas all over Churchill and the university and blah, blah, blah. Right next to me is a Verizon tower. That Verizon tower cost over seven figures to put up. Why? It wasn't materials. It was city bureaucrat, city meeting, city bureaucrat, city meeting. It was bureaucracy and oligarchy like coming out of that. And like I can run something out of my window. Like that's where these tokens are like new economic formation to solve cold starts. Like tokens are like oligarchy busting mechanisms. You can never take on Verizon. Now I can do that for a couple hundred bucks. That's absolutely radical. And so that idea of heal as crypto's capital formation, it looks stupid to the surface. New capital formation always looks stupid. You look at Bonk and you're like, oh, it's dog coin, blah, blah. It's like, no, no. Bonk is a seed fund. Bonk is a decentralized seed fund that went out to developers. Harvard Business School will be writing case studies on Bonk 50 years from now, saying like, look at like what this did to an ecosystem is a different way of thinking about it. Or like airdropping to like Saga. That's fine. Interesting. Like I predict you'll see airdrops on the application layer to things like Helium Mobile holders, right? Like why? Because there's their net new people to crypto. Like informal survey, it's a bunch of, you know, teens and preteens getting off their parents' phone plans. I don't care anything about crypto. Like incentivizing those folks is crazy. So that cash where it comes from, yeah, it comes out of Verizon, but it actually comes out of like decaying atrophied institutional setups and like we're doing it through the market we're not asking the city or the state or the fed to like streamline their process we're actually running isp this was the dream of like the internet when we ran isp back in the 90s and like it just wouldn't really work or we ran computation like the the seti program on your desktop like that's render or io or whatever you want to do so that's like super duper important like I, i've gone on and on and if you're listening you're like oh, okay i guess why do i care like it's from a socio-historical perspective, like you may have noticed like things might not be great right now. Like why is that? Uh, war, Fed, interest rate, blah, 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 blah. Like social historians in my school of like, like we view things like really deep structure is how we look at it. And deep structure is geography and it's also demographics. Like there's a demographic inversion. We're going from four workers supporting one retiree to 12 retirees being supported by one worker globally as well as in the u.s you can't work your way out of that through productivity even with ai that's like global crisis the way we've gotten out of that before the last time was in the middle ages and we got out of that through generative tech that had capital formation from participation where people without a bunch of cash could accrue value through their interaction that's not ubi or governments but markets as solutions it's the only way to break institutions out of them. Everybody says, oh, institutions bypassed by tech. What are you going to do about it? The only way to like break out of that, and they get more militant, the more, the more threatened they are. The only way to break out of that is just like when the king tried to preserve land, you can only break out of that through new capital formation powered by generative tech, capitalism. So contrary to like your 80-year-old senators, like the use case for crypto is capitalism. Yeah, you know, once when I was in my Web2 world, the prominent VCs like, hey, what's the use case for crypto? And you could say, okay, finance, what's the use case for money? What's the use case for a database? But like, the more I think about it, I'm really coming to the conclusion, it's like, what's the use case for a business model, for a new business model that accrues value to users? That's like madness. Like, it's no longer two guys in a garage that you don't know, so you don't have access to the next Google. You can do that with 50K people globally right now. You can do an airdrop through Bonk. That's like, that's absolutely radical. So that's the overarching thesis, basically, that like, Crypto is not just store of value, it's generative tech, and it's generative tech meets new capital formation. New capital formation previously LLC, that's great, but it accrues to FANG. New generative tech, that's great, but it's FANG. Like putting them together is like literally, literally a renaissance. And that's a that's the real power of crypto. We're just starting to see that. I don't expect people to like come to that conclusion or even get it in this cycle, like maybe the next cycle. But I think that's like the massive unlock that has like huge implications that gets us out of like a demographic and a socioeconomic hole, gets us out of QE and money printer go burr, and that potentially gets us out of like a host of other things. It's not that history always rhymes. It, it doesn't. It doesn't repeat exactly, but there's these contours that you can kind of see. And so if history rhymes, I think 
I think there's a number of implications for us to be thinking about if anything I'm saying is even remotely true. Let me pause there, take a breath, light my pipe. I certainly agree on the capitalism part. Actually, Patrick McCormick has a post on this as well, how crypto kind of hypercharges capitalism. Uh, really, really good piece. So I, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Quick break to tell you about Access Protocol, the easiest and best way to stay up to date on what's happening in crypto by following your favorite publishers. And you can do all of it without a subscription, without having to worry about ads. And we all know subscriptions. How many do you have? 10, 20? Can you cancel it? It's all a mess. Well, Access Protocol solves this and they do it in a crypto native way. They have over 60 publishers that include CoinGecko, The Block, Crypto Slate, and a whole long list of independent creators. So how it works is you find your favorite publishers and you stake the ACS token. That's the Access token. And once you stake, you have access to all that creator's content without the hassle of ads or subscriptions that you can't cancel and you don't know how many you have. Access Protocol already has over 225,000 users that are finding new creators, that are reading content, and even receiving NFTs from these creators because one of the cool things with Access Protocol is that these publishers, they can know who their subscribers are. They can make it where, okay, maybe we'll do an in-person event or maybe we'll do an NFT drop and we'll do it only to our most loyal stakers, aka readers. In early 2024, they're even releasing V2. It's crypto native, it's on Solana, and it's an awesome product. Put a link in the show notes to the hub uh, it's the easiest way to get started. So go check them out today. Quick break to tell you about an upcoming event I promise you don't want to miss. It's Blockworks' biggest and best institutional conference called DAS London. It's a two-day event happening in London this March. We're going to have over 700 institutions, 130 speakers, and a couple thousand of us all under one roof. Crypto is in a position for the first time to actually onboard these institutions, and they're showing up. We have companies from BlackRock to Visa launching real products in the space. We have the real-world asset narrative taking off. We have things like payments that have been exponentially growing. And then we have things like DPEN happening in the Solana ecosystem. There's a ton of capital right now in this institutional space that's going to be coming on chain. It's going to completely change the industry. Whether you are an institution or you're a retail user, or you just want to learn more about what's going on in the space, this conference is for you. You're going to be able to meet some of the best and smartest people in the space. The speaker lineup is absolutely incredible and you'll get to hang out with me. But the best part is you actually get 10% off your ticket if you use Lightspeed 10 when checking out. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, I recommend buying this today because one, you'll forget about it. Two, these ticket prices go up every single month. So anyways, I hope to see you there. Now let's get back to the show. While we're talking about, uh, 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 being militant and uh, tokens and information. Uh, you obviously have a unique lens on this. Um, let's talk about tribalism, right? Uh, you have people forming religions due to the tokens that they hold. What do you think about this? What is the historical framing here that, that helps you think through this? Try. I haven't, I haven't seen any of that on crypto Twitter. What are you talking about, Mert? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm messing with you. That's like, yeah, tribalism, anytime, okay, anytime you go from one single thing, like they call it hegemony, like oligarchical control, institutional authority of like, not only what you're able to do, but conditioning of like Overton window of what you're able to think if you're really good about it, it doesn't even occur to you the idea of another, like anytime you break that apart, and you break it apart with like generative tech and like new capital formation, like now you've now you've shattered the box. Now you've like opened like a, you've you've done, set off a glitter bomb, right? It's it's everywhere, and that's always the criticism of that. It's going to be messy. It's going to be bizarre. How do I figure out? I have agency, but now how am I going to surface and discover? Well, all that's all that's totally true. The, the bet is always worth it, and there's no choice. Like it always moves in that direction. You can't get out of that once that happens. And so like one of the historical functions that you see happening is like tribalism around that. And so like I have one thing, one religion, one nation state, one source of authority. And now I say, hey, one, one identity. You have to be a farmer. You have to stay on this land. You don't have permission. You literally can't leave. You can't go more than a couple miles. You can't do any of this stuff. Now you have opportunity. I can literally do other things. I can join another community. I can go to another city. I can no longer be a farmer and be part of that guild. I can set up as a shop. Now I have all these other things I can do, right? I can put my allegiance in different areas in different ways. Now I have choice. Like out of that, like out of that, I, tribalism is like super important. It plays like a very important historical function to a point, And then it starts to become a bug instead of a feature. So in the early days, it's almost like incentivizing a cold start network. Like in the early days, people have nothing. You're asking participants, this gets to the heart of the problem, to like literally create something from nothing. So you have to do that as like a matter of belief. You can't, there's like no rash, as a venture capitalist, you know, either bet against the market or get them big on something early. And so like the idea is like, you're asking people to do something that has like no rash, no, not just rational, logical way, like, but like no evidence of doing that. And in fact, a lot of negative evidence because like the rails for communication are going to tell you not to do that. Your alpha is against the market, right? Like meaning that um, everyone's going to tell you the opposite. So it's not like faith is an absence of, of evidence. It's faith is like opposite evidence. And so you're asking people to do that. So of course, they're going to be like 
tribal about it. And they're going to say, hey, I've been conditioned in this world to have one thing, and that is who I am. And now I have the option to have another thing. And that's great. I can get rid of that guy because I don't like him. And I'm going to go to this other thing. And that's going to be my thing. And like that works. That's just what happens. Like you have to have early adopters. You have to have people do that. You have to have crypto Twitter be junior high boys locker room. It's like, it's just what you, they play a super important function. Otherwise the network and the system, it would never work. And then at a certain point, like it, it either eats itself. And those are the renaissances you never hear from again. And there's dozens of those, or it basically breaks out beyond its original bounds to net new people. And those net new people don't give a damn at all about like your particular thing. Like the, the theorists will talk about this, like in terms of one thing versus uh, monoism versus pluralism, right? I mean, in a religious theocratic sense, I mean, like the idea of like having choice. So rather than saying like, hey, I have one source of authority and now I think one thing is bad. So I want a decentralized thing and now I want one decentralized thing. And that's the most decentralized thing is the very best thing. So I can have only that. Those movements don't work out very well historically. The ones that do are pluralistic, where they say, hey, the idea of having something other than this first thing, I have this idea of choice. And now that instead of just being a replacement for a monopole, it's a new pole on a spectrum where all along that spectrum, I have design space. And like you always have like opportunity costs and you're always making like allocate, you're always making trades and decisions on it. Different design space for different use cases, different sets of values for different instances, basically. Like that's that like opens up that opens up capitalism. That's how it like works successively. If we create like a single decentralized thing that replaces the last decentralized thing that fails historically, it just doesn't work. And also, to be blunt, it's kind of middle of the curve thinking. It's like, I won't get generational on this, like I'm an old guy, Gen X, but there's definitely this like idea, like chains have values. And like, if we all pick the same chain, then we'll have the same values and we'll be holding hands and singing like along a Coca-Cola commercial. It's like, I just don't buy that at all. You always want checks and balances historically. It doesn't work out well unless you have that. Even if you hate that other thing and your thing is best, like you want that to be there. And honestly, there's going to be times where it is best to have that other thing there. And so at a certain point, you're loud and obnoxious and blah, 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 blah. And then that goes away. Like, it's very difficult because the people that like made their money and made their, I don't mean within crypto, I mean, even the, the all in guy or whoever you're listening to that's outside crypto, they climb the mountain outside in a different way. It's, there's nothing more difficult for someone else to climb another mountain. It's just like, it's super difficult for them to admit that they were wrong on this when they're at the apex of like their fame and what have you. And so saying like, oh, I want to do something else. But like, that's the way it works out historically. And like, honestly, that's like super important. I don't want to get too philosophical on it, but like in terms of identity, instead of having one identity that's given to you, you actually being in control of your identity, sovereign individual, blah, blah, fine. The way it works out historically is having multiple identities, like in the sense of you choosing different levels and different layers of privacy and perspectivity and like opacity for different contexts and different ways where you can project out and retract four different use cases into different instances. Husband, father, bourbon drinker, businessman, whatever it is. We, we do this kind of natively in different ways. Maybe people have different Twitter accounts or maybe behave differently on Twitter and LinkedIn. And so this is just a technological evolution of that. And for a movement to succeed, you need net new people who don't care about the, your particular thing. Those net new people will be attracted to like the market actually like rewarding different applications from utility and different design space. Like long story short, if you're like a maximalist sell it, you fade out to irrelevance if the movement wins. If you don't fade out to ir irrelevance, the movement dies. And if you're a pluralist, like you don't, you don't eviscerate your enemies. Your enemies actually have a place on the design space spectrum, and like that's a much more like favorable outcome in my way of thinking. Sorry, I, I, I might have gone sideways on you, Mert. Sorry. No, I think that was really great. I think this is one of crypto superpower is that right now uh, people's identity and. I'm not trying to sound philosophical because I'm not, but people's identity are like more in flux than ever, especially like the more distributed you get and society is, whether that's like out your house and you're watching Netflix and then you're ordering in Uber Eats and you never have to leave and you're living in the boonies. Um, and the more distributed and decentralized things are, you almost are looking for like an identity to attach to. And that's something I think that you see in meme coins today, which is almost that like collective experience that you can get around. And so it's kind of weird because like, I don't know, you could say there's no real tangible value there, but there obviously is something there, which is like an identity and community. So I would love maybe your thoughts on that. And maybe you can somehow tie it into because when you were talking, uh, it made me think of just the, the term Ethereum aligned. Uh, that is a form of identity. Like, what do you think about that? Yeah, like, um, oh man, um, <clears throat> I'm probably not smart enough to like handle that 
question. The, the alignment, like I'm market aligned, I'm open source aligned, I'm decentralization aligned, and I think different types of decentralization and different contexts work for different reasons. And sometimes moderated and modified decentralization, it's just like, it's just like, hey, Garrett, we were chatting before the show and you're like, hey, I was visiting Paris, you know, where I used to live and uh, like the, all of a sudden this baron, like he bulldozed all these like alleyway, these grand boulevards, right? And so like, that's kind of crazy. So like one of the reasons I love Paris is because like you have these great grand boulevards that have high throughput, like from monument to monument. And like there's military reasons they did that, obviously. And then, you, you, but you didn't get rid of everything and like just wipe it like some other cities. There's still these like medieval like, you know, neighborhoods where you can go basically, right? And you can just duck off into an alleyway and you're like back 500 years. And so you get the best of both worlds in this ecosystem. It can't just be one single thing versus another single thing. And so the idea of being aligned to like one type of thing, it's like, it's great. I hope it works. Like it just can't be the single thing. If it's like one single thing that replaces the last single thing, it just, everybody loses basically. If you have the best system, the most decentralized system, and it's just, it, we end up with a monopoly or even a duopoly, it's it's going to be a historic failure. That's like not my opinion. That's just how like the arc of history tends to work. And so like I have bags and Bitcoin and ETH and Solana and crazy other stuff that I'm too embarrassed to even talk about. Like the idea behind that is like super important. The meme stuff is like, yeah, I mean, people say, hey, internet culture and it's a way to buy on it and bid and express. And like, that's totally true. Like th when we say printed press, like most of the printed material was image based is the first time they had images. And these images were like had semiotic function, basically. The thing meant something beyond that. It wasn't just like a symbol. It actually was like a doorway into a different like reality, basically expressing like who you were, the idea of like a other po plausible world that was possible. That's what you need to be able to step out as a zealot to be able to create something new in the first place. Like those also had like, like uh, mimetic value on top of that. Like, so they're actually worth something. And so that idea of like, these weird images and silliness. And if you look back at the Flugschrift and the, the old timey prints that really took the world by storm, they account for like 80% of the printed material. Like those were like crazy, it was crazy stuff. It's like demons pooping out, papal curio. It was like the most batshit crazy stuff you could ever possibly imagine. And that's what people ran with. Like that idea of like shit posting and memeing that comes with the birth of media. And the theoreticians like the Web2, like Darlings, like Marshall McLuhan, they'll talk about that from like Gutenberg Galaxy and what have you. It's like, my only point is, this is a phenomenon that happens every single time. Nobody knows why. I happen to think there's like deep-seated like community identity, like properties to it. Of course, it's semiotic. Of course, it's mimetic. You should expect it every time. Like, and it's like deeply powerful. Like it kind of ties into one of the things you're talking about, like the bridge between digital and like IRL. Like that's a way to like identify like you in a digital. So what happened with print was like not just being generative technology, but it was synthetic abstraction layer. You could literally leave where you were go somewhere else, come back with other knowledge, lose track of time and space. It was like you get burnt in the Middle Ages, you get burnt for that. It's like black magic, right? Like, and so you came back with knowledge. And so you went from a physical world into a synthetic world, came back with skills, built your physical world better. That print was like a bi-directional doorway between synthetic and IRL space. And so the idea of having like an image is an unlock to that, whether it's an NFP of a pixelated cat, it's much more important than just the pixelated cat. Like where it takes real traction is when that actually interacts with IRL space specifically. That's why like I am a bit obsessed right now with like the helium stuff, like not just mobile, but like those being NFTs, right? Like those being like bi-directional doorways, like where you do stuff in the synthetic world and enjoy the fruits in the real world or do stuff in the real world, enjoy fruits in the synthetic world. Like that's what those like coins are. And like, you'll see those increasingly tied to real world utility, whether it's like bonk on a saga or like net new, like application on like helium mobile or whether it's like, those NFTs being able to use not just to unlock experiences, but unlock like real physical infrastructure. And that's like, that's when it gets interesting for me, like in this like kind of capitalism I'm talking about, where you're not just benefiting yourself, you're benefiting yourself by creating value for yourself and your neighbor, like net new de Nova. That's like, it gets really interesting. So I've been obsessed a little bit with like helium as like a business model for cold solving cord starts, but also like local neighborhood impact. And that's like literally why we did this building you know, burnt down during prohibition. It was an old bourbon bar and heroin fires next door. It was a disaster slated for mini storage in a parking lot. And so we ran like a helium IOT node, 500 bucks, a mobile phone, and like use that way back when to finance a restoration of that. Anyone could do it. So they were sending more police. It was an eyesore, neighborhood crime. Can you literally transform and impact your physical space? Like, yeah, you can. You can do that with like no coding necessary. Like, what do you need to do that? Well, you need to get on big on something early. 
how did we know about that? Like, Mert, to your point, we were reading Multicoin's white papers, right? We're like, frick. So you have to like get in with your time and attention, not necessarily a lot of capital. Like anyone can do that. So that's why it's like super fascinating, like not just the tribalism, but that interaction between your synthetic identity and world and now money and communication, time and attention, like being bridged, not to a different chain, but to IRL through like these deep end networks, I think is like the next like massive, interesting, like unlock basically. Okay, Josh, the capital formation bit of it makes sense to me because something like Helium is very hard to, when you build out physical infrastructure, it's like, how are you going to get the capital for that? And that is something that you can do with crypto today. Um, But the whole NFT side of it and how it ties in the physical world to the digital world to me doesn't always, I can't always see the value there Um, because you can already do a lot of that with the internet today. Um, And something you've pointed out before is that Crypto has actually shown in certain use cases that it like speeds up the velocity of physical items and not only how much is traded, but also in the value. So I'm just curious, like, why is that? Because in some ways, I feel like you can do that on the Internet today. And like this phrase comes to my mind. It's like the medium is the message, which is that like <laughs> marketing term. And like, is that it? Is it just because it's the medium is now crypto? It, it you know, brings this new value or is it? No, something no, different than so- the man, that's so good. Look at you. You're doing these deep cuts. That's yeah, that's Marshall McLuhan. That's like. That's he started with Gutenberg Galaxy and talks about that, like in the history of media. And like he's the Web 2.0 darling, although I think that's like uh, unnecessarily narrowing him. So, no. So, yeah, man, that's a the best way. So, like NFTs, like remove. All right. So, people say, hey, like digital ownership, digital ownership for digital things, pixelated cats, fine. Digital ownership for physical things. Oh, interesting. I don't have the deed down at my local blah, 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 and have to trust a mortgage company as a trust broker. I can see the trust on chain and have it automated and get rid of all that. Fine. Like, that, I kind of get it. How does that unlock liquidity? Like, that's where, like, I'm super interested in, like, like deep in, like, basically, like, unlocking liquidity by, like, removing trust and creating, like, velocity from utility. And, like, this is all blah, 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 blah. So I'm just going to give you an example. And, like, full disclosure, I'm biased. I love these guys. Like, Baxus, B-A-X-U-S, is, like, they're on Solana. They basically, and there's other people doing things like this. Americana and Frey does this on Ethereum and for different things. Bax is just focusing on booze. They literally take bottles of booze. They scan them. They vault them as an NFT. Like you have that now. Interesting. Fine. Easy peasy. Like what happens with that? Like, like I, I, these are bottles I could never wise get. I could never wise buy. Fine. Like rather than like, what happens when I don't have to physically ship the bottle tw- every time I do that and insure it and run risk? If I can trade one bottle for another bottle, if I'm super into the stuff, could be Pokemon cards on other stuff I'm talking about, or it could be whatever. The idea is not having to physically ship the stuff and sift through like eBay ratings or do some shady Craigslist thing. All of a sudden, I can start trading like rapidly because the bottle doesn't move from that physical location. And so I trade again and again and again. It's like that paperclip meme, right? I trade it up to a truck, basically. And if I have alpha, if I think actually like esoteric knowledge, I know my bourbon, right? Like I basically, I'm able to like trade up there. I'm able to find stuff I could never otherwise find. And maybe it surfaced. So like all that was available on the internet, kind of. I didn't necessarily have trust that I actually own the thing or that you own the thing. I had to go through a broker. Maybe that could be brokered. But by doing that as a digital artifact on chain, like representing ownership, I can like much more rapidly do it again and again and again. I can do it on a whim at the push of a button. Like on backs, like they don't even know they're using crypto. It's like 70, just like Helium Mobile, a bunch of like teen and preteens getting off their like parent cell phones, which is great and like earning it for free. Like these are 70 and 80 year olds like walking through this and like they have a whiskey portfolio they're looking at rather than doing stocks because they're into that and they have alpha and like that you see velocity have a massive uptick on that like that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. That's like one level of it, basically. And then you have all the auction mechanics or like offers, all the normal things you would see, level one. Level two is like on the the backside, like I trust that you have this bottle. I trust that it's authentic. So I'm going to machine vision match it. I trust you having it in the thing, blah, blah, blah. Like how do I know these va- assets tend to go up, not financial historical advice, but like whiskey tends to age, fine. Like how do I know that it's only if it's been kept, right? How do I know you didn't like put it under a heat lamp or whatever, right? Like, well, that's actually, I can use something like a sensor for environment, maybe something like helium, maybe not doing it on bottles, but maybe doing it on casts or barrels, basically. So now I can see like all this environmental stuff on top of it. I'm not saying they're doing that, but I'm saying that would be like a really interesting use case for like, instead of just uncorking something and hoping it happens to work, maybe I trust the auction 
or maybe I trust the person who had it, but he'd never tell me if it went bad anyway, because why would you? And it might not have gone bad. You don't know until you open that cork. Now I have all this, not only provenance, but environmental stuff online, on-chain visibility, along with price discovery. When the volatility goes up, and I don't want to quote numbers, but it's pretty crazy, like I actually have better price discovery like through that. So like that's other one other idea that like comes up, like bringing liquidity to illiquid markets is a massive upside for producers and for like individuals. And then I can connect on a marketplace based on that, uh, which is like super interesting. Instead of trying to drop stuff, I can drop it to select users based on like them opting in to like history, knowing their profile. So all that stuff I could do online, I guess, but I don't have like trust that the, uh, I don't have trust that I can do it instantly. I'm trusting that individual or that entity rather than reading it on chain. And when I can do that with a web two interface with authority on chain from web three, man, velocity takes off like a freaking rocket. The next, the second level unlock to that is being able to trade or exchange the online NFT with the offline or IRL NFT, trading a piece of, you know, trading a favorite bottle for Mad Labs, right? That's where like composability, not just technical composability, but like business model composability gets really interesting. I have some bourbon. I know what I'm into. I trade it paperclip up, basically. I, I basically, I, I hop on Helium Mobile. I don't know anything about crypto. Now I'm buying a bottle of booze. I swap it to Mad Lab. I got a discount on Jupiter. It's virtuous, basically which is like really, really interesting. So I think the to-dos on this are really looking for these net new users, which are going to be wanting wanting Web2 interface, but like with Web3 trust, but not knowing that it's Web3 trust behind the scenes. Is that helpful? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's just so much to to run with there. Um, it just makes me think, and you know, you're talking about generative, generative wealth, generative ideas and how tech can affect so much, not only digitally, but in the physical world. And like one example that's jumping out to me as well that maybe you could relate to is, I want to say it was Slack started off as like a gaming service. And then they noticed people were just using it for chat, really. And chat's not new. People have been chatting forever, but they just gave them a better form to do it. And then through that, you have chat, you have teams, you have all these services that popped up. And eventually you even have derivatives of that, which is like Zoom and these other ways to communicate. And um, that's all digital and it's all new. It's all new value. Those companies worth billions of dollars c- came out of nowhere, even though chat always existed. And then it actually moved the physical world because through that, people started working remotely. So people actually started getting moved around. So anyways, I, th- I think it's fascinating. I mean, sometimes when I, I remember listening to your old Bankless episodes and I'm like, oh, they're so gung-ho, not even you, but the hosts. And I'm like, man, sometimes it's like, is this too much? Because like, it's just crypto, you know, it's just a thing that we do day in, day out. And but it does have these changes. And I think it just probably also takes longer than people think sometimes, right? And it's also when things are changing in the moment, you can't notice it. Because you can look back and say, the, you know, the Renaissance was this amazing thing. But I'm sure at times, like, it took a long time to play out in some ways, right? Like, some things were fast, some things were slow. But it didn't change everyone's life instantly, even though I know things move, things move faster today because of the internet. Man, you said so much in there. That's so good. Yeah, that it's like, I'm not into crypto. Like, I'm not into crypto for its own sake. I'm not into it for a number. The generative tech is interesting, but the business model is crazy. Like as a founder and then investor, it's like I know like building moats to keep out challengers is like what what our venture like industrial complex has done. So the idea of being able to jump these moats, the most interesting stuff, 99.99999% of interesting businesses ideas can like never make it because it can't jump a moat. And so like those that long tail distribution curve of like really interesting ideas and products and services like esoteric stuff that's crazy if you can like actually have economic substrate, if you can build a business on that using a new business model, that's where innovation will come from. It won't be from AI doing more stuff. It will be from new things happening powered by that. And like, that's like really, really important rather than jumping through an incubator, hoping you get access and just randomly happenstance finding the two guys in the garage doing Google, like you can literally participate in that. That's like, that's really substantial. And your point, like, it doesn't seem that way. Like in history, like, people in the middle of the biggest changes are usually least aware of it at the time. It's like a paradoxical, like almost axiomatic. And like, that's because like the surface ripples, you see those, the, you know, the currents a little bit more, but the deep underlying things are slow until they're fast. And you look up and you're, you're totally different at the time. It looks volatile. It looks FUD. It looks institutional resistance. It looks crazy. And then you start to get an inkling that like, Hey, maybe there's something here, but you're always looking at the most obvious thing. Crypto is number go up and store a value. It's true. That's great. That's a ripple. Crypto is generative tech, like the internet, like building something new. That's like, that's freaking magic. That's like substantial. That's crazy. 
crypto is a new form of capitalism, as new business models, a new way to like form capital that's participatory. That's like craziness. And like the upshot of that is if you're listening to all this stuff, like the tendency is everybody goes off and they have a deep think and they smoke their pipe and they shoot shit like they're a philosophy, like major freshman or whatever. Like the upshot of this is you have access to something like monumentous right now, even if you don't know it. Like the way we did the transformation of the space wasn't was by having a couple hundred bucks and like knowing about something early that everybody in the world had access to that crypto Twitter and mainstream media was shitting on constantly, like, and that had substantial effect, like in the local neighborhood. And so like, what does all that mean? Like if this whole thing rhymes, like, I guess what I'm saying is like that new form of capitalism, that means you're no longer like an office worker, like, cause you, even if you don't have extra cash to invest, you invest time and attention. You do that all the time with like Netflix, with Twitter, with whatever you're using. Like, what if you can become an owner of those things you use? And if those are like asymmetric upside as a possibility. And so that basically means that everyone, if you're listening to this, you are a venture capitalist. You are an entrepreneur. You are a team member of a startup. That divide is false. Like VC, like you get this bad rap. Oh, it's a VC thing. It's like, that's like, that's middle curve, man. That's like VC stalled out years ago. The very best top quartile are getting 5X over 10 years without a liquidity premium. It's like, it's stupid, right? And that's like best of the best. Like, is that what you want? Like you right now have better access than top quartile VCs, open information. Yeah, it's not perfect. You can't get into everything private, but you can literally read, know what Multicoin's thinking right now. You can read their white papers. You can look at their Twitter. Like you can get into stuff like very early, not every Google in a garage, but a lot of them. The Rolodex isn't your alpha. It's your experience if you're doing this. Like the, Google is two guys in the garage despondent and ready to sell for a million bucks. That's how it always is. If you're doing a startup, you know that. Like, hats off to Merck. Like, that was our experience, like, for sure, doing it repeatedly. VCs know that. You have never seen that before, accredited or not. You don't see the volatility and craziness. That's always why it's there. You've seen Apple IPO go up a little bit, but you haven't seen Larry and Sergey willing to say, screw it and sell for a million bucks. That's what's going on right now. And so this is a recreation of VC where you have the same access into this, that thing nobody says. Like VC doesn't know when to sell. They, they don't have that skill set usually, trad VC. And they're conservative. You place your bets, you wait to see what happens. Like that business model, there's only so many and they've atrophied and it's an execution play. And you as a founder have to go through dog and pony show after dog and pony show. You don't have to do that. You have time and attention. And instead of being the product, you're now an owner. And so what that means is you got to sit, if you want to play this game, you, have you can stay on the medieval farm or you can go out and hang your own shingle. Like I vote for the latter because you only get so many opportunities. Like if you, what does it mean? You have to invert like the market. You have to like sift information. Crypto Twitter is going to tell you it's awful. Everybody outside of it, regular Twitter. That's because by nature, your alpha is betting against the market and being right or betting big on something new, which takes very little time and attention. And you might actually learn something along the way. And so one mental exercise, say, hey, what if we invert everything that we know we take all the medieval axioms of being an indentured servant on a farm. We say, what if it's all upside down? What if volatility is good? What if TLV is wrong metric? What if new business models are based on more, not less? What if institutional FUD is a leading indicator in alpha? And like, that's like really, really crazy. Like this exponential technology creating new markets and net new, that's like, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive to the medieval mind. We're not talking about more monks writing more manuscripts, but printing presses and ledgers. The arc of history is betting on this X potential technology. And like that always happens in the marketplace. Gutenberg and Luther, you know, they're academic. He's an academic, but he did his work in the marketplace. That's how the thing worked. And you know about it. And like that new capital formation, being able to bust a monarchy, capitalism, take down monarchy tokens, bust oligarchies and duopolies. That's crazy. And so like we talked about like embracing pluralism and all that stuff. That's good. The best stuff comes from the edges of ideas and business models. That's the other virtue of pluralism and design space, not just business model and technological, but philosophical and ethical. Like the other idea that this unlocks, if history rhymes at all, is that vocation, this idea of oh, what I want to do with my life. What They had an idea of calling, vocation, and how do you find what you're supposed to do? Their answer was find what you like to do and what you're good at and do that to make a living at it. Don't sit in an office filing TPS reports unless you really like it. Like if your alpha is booze or building an ISP or music, do that. And like that's where the crossover for physical space is so interesting. Like, you know, in D-Pin, your cost centers become revenue generation. So 
you know, if I pay my rent by running something or pay my service or like instead of paying a credit card, I basically stake it in through payment. Like now I can pursue, I want to have a My Little Pony Cafe or an Eddie Graham Pove Cafe. Now I can like subsidize it with crypto as an economic engine. So buy your Lambo and then think about public good, but public good through preserving your own and your neighbor's interests intersecting by doing what you like and what you're good at. And like, ironically, the more human it is in physical space, like that becomes more valuable in a system of abundance than less. And so like, it should be exciting. Like I, I watch Breakpoint and it's a bunch of developers, no offense, Mert. And like, these guys are just dropping bomb after bomb. And like tech, technologists to me is like, holy frick. And like, it's like golf clap applause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, there should be marching bands and cheerleaders and like lions busting through flame and hoops out there when they're announcing some of that stuff. It's just crazy. It's like, it's an amazing like, age we're in and you have like an amazing opportunity for this like vocation it's like that's why the community and the coin stuff is so interesting it's like it's fun and it's excitement it's like it's a heck of a thing to discover that you have agency you're in the cusp of transforming your world from institutional decay through generative creation not relying on the government or hoping an external force comes in to solve it but by doing it yourself in your own interest with your community through a marketplace and that power is deeply rooted in history and you actually have a chance to participate in it so you don't have to do it but like you only get so many chances and like make the most of your time it's so well said um yeah you it, you're kind of hitting on agency again which we brought up at the beginning which agency is so great and also kind of scary i think like especially if you're kind of new to crypto and you're listening to this, one thing that I would tell you that I often think of, you know, sometimes we have large hacks in this space where it's like, oh, another $100 million is gone, another bug. And uh, people are like, why are we here? Like, what are, what are we doing? Like, this is this is, is not the future. Um, if you listen to Josh today, I think you can see there is a lot of turbulence over time as you have these new technologies and these communities building. But also, one thing that gives me optimism is just the amount of intellectual talent that's in crypto. It's like, even if blockchain for some reason was not a thing the people that are here in this space like those are the type of people you want to be around and they're going to create something of value whether that's what we're looking at today or in the future so i think like that's what keeps me here no that's so good and like those hacks like i guess that's one other thing i could have said like all that's true that needs to be there unless you're falling on your face in public in the public square you're not that's your alpha is actually building the thing and so the thing that if you're new to crypto you might want to think about is it doesn't have more of that stuff. Crypto is just rendering visible what's been opaque previously. There's, ha I mean, I could tell you stories about traditional finance, bank account seized, so and so kicked off for no reason, checking account closed with somebody because they didn't do so, like for zero visibility. That happens all the time. Or main big six banks like doing nation state stuff that makes status like stuff you don't hear about. It's always the case. Just like the venture volatility is always the case. You're just seeing about it, so it seems. It seems more risky and it seems more scary. That's because like you're actually getting visibility to what's going on behind the hood. And that like ties directly to your talent point. The people with talent, yeah, it's scary, but man, you're gonna the the good folks are gonna wanna participate in that, right? Like they're gonna be drawn to that, like moss to a flame or or cockroaches to whatever to use totally stuff. Like the point <laughs> is like, yeah, it's like for myself, it's the same thing. Like I couldn't imagine doing anything else just because the the pace and like power and interesting part of not just the conversation, but the market creation is like here, everything else is like boring, but I guess that's kind of an out. I, I pivoted from AI into crypto though. So like a, probably an outlier, but like, I think this is where it's at hands down. Yeah. hundred percent agree. Well, Josh, you've dropped like bomb after bomb of insights. I don't I, like this podcast. I could talk to you for three hours. I don't think we can go longer or people are just gonna be overwhelmed. So <laughs> it's already too good. So Josh, thank you so much for coming on. This is probably the most fun conversation I've had on here. So thanks so much. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Keep it up. Oh, yeah. yeah. By the way, I just want to say, like, I, I do know that you guys are like the brains and the horsepower behind uh, behind Blockwork. So if anybody's listening, like, that's really you and uh, Mert versus, uh, you know, Toll, you know, other guys. So like, thanks for having me on. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Okay. So I did mention Josh's like previous episodes, obviously listen to Lightspeed, no other podcast, but I will put links to those. So you should check them out because they're great as well. Well, uh, thanks again, Josh. We'll see you next time. All right. I've got a little ending note here. First, thank you so much for listening to the full episode. If you really liked it, hit subscribe. But secondly, make sure you sign up for DAS. This is Blockwork's biggest institutional conference happening in London in March. I've included a link in the show notes and also a discount code. You get 10% off. Make sure to use Lightspeed 10 when you sign up. All right. I'll see you there and I'll see you next time on Lightspeed.